Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. My guest today is somebody that I feel it is a really poignant time to bring him to you. I've been trying to get him on for a while, and it just worked out perfectly. He's a journalist, a documentary filmmaker, and serves on the board of the Free Speech Coalition, which is fighting every day to protect the rights and the freedoms of the adult industry. Welcome, Mike Stabile. Hi, glad to be here. Hi, <laughs> I'm glad you are here. It's been, uh, yeah, we've been talking about this for a while. Yes, and as you said, like this is a really important time, right? Yeah. And I think that that part of the reason that it's been so hard to get on is because there's been so much going on, mm -hmm. right? That it, it paradoxically makes it difficult to, you know, when you're actually doing the work, it's difficult then to talk about the work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then, of course, when we arranged to have this uh, podcast, it was before Biden dropped out. And now, so because I tend to release these podcasts a couple of weeks after I record them, unless of course you're a Patreon member and you're watching it live at patreon.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered for only $5 a month. The timing may seem a little off. Who knows what's going to happen between now <laughs> and when this releases in a couple of weeks, because it's been, it's been a wild month. Yeah. But at this point, um, Trump, there was the assassination attempt on Trump and then Biden dropped out and it looks like Kamala Harris is going to be the Democratic nominee. But before we get into all that fun stuff, because I know how much you guys love politics, uh, let's talk okay. about your beginnings and like how you got into this career where you're being an advocate for the adult industry. You know, I mean, it's odd because I came into this sort of accidentally, right? Mm -hmm. I had been um, you know, working in, I'd worked as a journalist, I'd worked as an editor, I'd been in New York, I moved back to San Francisco, I was sort of bouncing around um, early 2000s and needed some extra work, right? Journalism and then later documentary filmmaking, like they're not necessarily the biggest money makers. You're not gonna get rich. Yeah, you're not gonna get rich. And so I was moving back, I was, I was back in San Francisco, I was looking for work and I had a friend who was sort of doing some uh, moonlighting for the adult industry, right? was writing press releases and stuff like that. And he's like, oh, you know, you, you might want to get involved. And, you know, there might be some extra work for you. If you can write a press release, if you can get stuff out. And like, again, I had a journalistic background. I was like, oh, I sort of know about this. And it was at the time when everything was moving online, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the thing with this is 20 years ago. I was going right? to say, like, it's what year is this? Time, right? <laughs> It's a long time ago. I've been in the yeah. adult industry for 26 years now. So like, yes. it's okay. I'm we're not like, in the, yes, I'm not <laughs> like, we're both aging each other. <laughs> yeah. um, but it was that time when you have everybody sort of moving online, right? They're mm -hmm. trying to do streaming. The whole industry is changing. VHS is falling. There's this new sort of, you know, feeling right about, you know, and a lot of money coming in. So I started doing some stuff around there. I started working um, in the business, but still was working in writing and, and and later sort of left entirely to work on a documentary, sort of came back and it was the early maybe 2010s. And um, there was a big attack on the industry, right? There was a lot of, at the time, there was an organization called AHF, the AIDS Healthcare Foundation, um, that was really going after the industry over condoms. Um, it was an organization that didn't like the industry and was was sort of using uh, health issues as a way to enact censorship. And the industry was having a hard time responding, right? Because the industry media hasn't always treated us well, mm -hmm. right? Um, they think that we're aliens. Mm -hmm. um, they think that we're criminals, criminal. sexual deviants. Yes, they uneducated. Don't you know, yeah. uh, not able to get any other kind of job. Yeah, I mean, I've heard it all. All the, all the stigma, all yeah. the stuff that, that happens. And so as a result, the industry was fairly locked down. We were underdoing, going, undergoing all these political attacks and the industry didn't know really how to respond, right? Everything they said would get twisted. Every, and, and as a result, they said less and less. And it meant that our opponents could really dominate the messaging. And at the time, I was sort of coming back in, I, into, I had been living in Argentina, I moved back to San Francisco, and I said, you know, actually, you're really doing a bad job in terms of the messaging. I think I can help here. Like, I, you know, again, I've worked as a journalist, I can help in, in terms of these stories. And I got involved with the fight over what became eventually Prop 60, uh, which was the, the condom ballot initiative in California. Um, and ended up serving as uh, the communications director for the campaign uh, in opposition to Prop 60. Mm -hmm. Did you go to the actual, um, was the hearing right in Oakland? 
I went to hearings in Oakland. I went into hearings, I think, in San Diego. Because there was that big one in Oakland that I went to that a lot of people in the adult industry went to. And they went and they, like, testified in front of OSHA, I believe. Yes. And actually, that was like this one time that I had, I was really seeing the adult industry come together, I feel like, in a way that I had never seen before. And I remember being really impressed by it and watching, you know, these people like testify, like, you know, this is my sexual health. This is my choice. I don't want to use condoms for these reasons. And, you know, on the surface, it makes sense to people who don't work in the industry, like, you know, why would I, like, why would you not want to use condoms? Like, this sounds like a safe and makes sense. Um, but there were so many reasons that condoms are like a huge problem to work with in um, scenes. I mean, I'll just say for those of you who may not know, like uh, they, the problem is with adult scenes is that it creates like chafing, right? Um, it leads to lower sensitivity with the guys. So they struggle performing because, you know, this is not your usual bedroom sex, right? Where it's like five, 10 minutes and, you know, that's it. It is like, you know, hours 25 an minutes, yeah. an hour, you know, whatever, under lights, stopping and starting. And it's it's a, just a different, it's just a different beast. And you're already testing every two weeks. Yes. I think that that is, is sort of it. It was a solution in search of a problem. Mm -hmm. And it was not done with the voices of the people who were most affected, right? right. So I think that you were absolutely right at that OSHA hearing. And, and I think a lot of other people had the same experience that you did, which is that when you're under attack and when you stand up and when then people listen to you, it's tremendously activating, mm -hmm. right? To have people say, wait, oh, I'm, I actually, my voice does matter. People were listening to me. I do have an experience that is not being represented in the debate. And if we all come together, we can defeat it. And I think that, that those OSHA hearings were, I mean, I, I talked to uh, Lotus Lane recently and mm -hmm. she was like, you know, when Prop 60 happened, that was when I really opened my eyes. When Measure B happened, when I got involved, I realized like, oh, I, people will listen to me if I speak, right? People right. will respond if I, I do it. I need to get over my own sort of self-doubt as to people won't won't care what I have to say or they're going to make fun of me or, or, or harass me or something like that. If I do speak out, people listen. And I think that that was a really activating moment for a lot of people in the industry. Yeah. Do you think that a lot of adult performers don't speak out because – maybe one, they don't know how to or where, or they feel, like you said, they have that self-doubt because the stigma surrounding their job, you know, we hear all the time and online and in the media that, you know, your your voices don't count because you're uneducated and you're unsafe and you're criminals and yeah. sexual deviants and all of these things. So it feels like, oh, people aren't going to listen to us because they don't they don't take us seriously. Well, mainstream media makes fun of porn stars all the time, yeah. right? So like it, it, it's this thing where they are constantly mocking, right? And, and constantly thinking that people are airheads or dumb or manipulated or something like that. And I think that that is... Um, you know, that does a number on you, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I think that, so I think that there's, that's part of it, right? I think that another part of it is you're trying to sell a product, right? And your audience has different political opinions, yeah. right? And so you don't necessarily want to turn off one group of purchasers, mm -hmm. right? Because we're all trying to make money, right? We're all trying to survive. You're trying to pay rent, trying to pay mortgage. You're trying to pay for school. You're trying to pay for health care. You're trying to pay for your kids, right? This is your livelihood. And you don't want to necessarily come out politically and say, I disagree with this if somebody is going to argue with you, even when it is essential to your business and your success and your, your, your livelihood. I think the third thing that happens is that people don't necessarily know or feel confident on the issues. And this happens all the time at FSC, um, you know, and, and online is that people say, you know, I know about age verification. I know about Project 2025. I know they're bad, but I, I don't know how to make that argument. And when somebody confronts me and says, you know, in my personal life or, you know, online with, you know, well, what about we don't let kids go to an R-rated movie? You know, I don't know how to respond. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, that makes sense because, you know, I spend all day talking about these issues. I go to legislatures. I go to hearings. I talk to press. I'm meeting with our legal team. You know, we're, we're doing all these things. I know the stories inside out. People who are selling content and, 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 and making videos and trying to make a living are trying to make a living, yeah. right? And they don't necessarily have the time to spend 
eight hours a day diving into, oh, this is the latest article and this is the latest development. And so I think that, you know, that it's just natural. Right? A lot of people have, you know, you're paying your bills, you're running your business, you're building an empire. You don't necessarily have time to understand like, what is the chilling effect that they're talking about in terms of, you know, ID verification or something mm-hmm. like that? Like, it can seem very esoteric. And and I think that what FSC is trying to do is to make it simple, to try to help people understand that, like, you can speak out. There are ways to do this that are effective um, and that we're here to help because, honestly, it's such a huge audience that, you know, we have to unlock it. Yeah. So for those who don't know, can you explain what the Free Speech Coalition or the FSC is and why it's so important to the adult industry? Yes. So the Free Speech Coalition is the trade and advocacy organization for the adult industry and its workers. In other words, we're essentially sort of what you might think of as a lobby, you know, or, you know, just an advocate, right, for our rights. And it started in the late 80s. at a time when the federal government was trying to push the industry out of business, right? It was raiding businesses. It was taking uh, distributors, um, you know, people who were selling, you know, uh, at that time, VHS tapes and magazines, Mm -hmm. um, taking them to trial, prosecuting them until they went bankrupt. Really sort of, it was a, a really conservative Reagan administration push. They thought the industry was evil. They wanted to put it out of business. Yes, there is a Presky First Amendment that sort of protects us, but the federal government takes you to, um, you know, takes you to trial. It's pretty hard for you as a business to defend yourself. Right. And so it started out as a coalition, right, of, of, of business owners coming together and saying, hey, listen, they're picking us off one by one. We need to create a fund to defend ourselves. We need to share information about what works in these trials and what doesn't. We need to sort of build a knowledge base about like what our rights are. And so that was sort of how it started. And so for years, Free Speech Coalition really provided that that service. After the Reagan administration and the Bush administration, uh, we had the Clinton administration. Clinton administration stopped obscenity prosecutions, Mm -hmm. right? They were like, this is not a priority for the federal government. And the industry had a chance to breathe for a little bit. And so FSC started things like the testing protocols, right? And started working within the industry uh, to fight, you know, bad laws that were coming in. One of the first ones was the California wanted a 25% tax on all adult products that were sold in the state. Um, you know, we fought that and won. And then trying to be a voice in defense of the industry, right? Because again, like I said, everybody's fighting for their own business. Everyone is constantly, like on an individual basis, we're all trying to run a business. We're all trying to make money. We're all trying to pay rent or mortgage or healthcare or whatever. You need a business the same way that there is, you know, the NRA or the the tech lobby or something like that who can sort of take that role and say, hey, listen, we know all of this information. We're going to be the experts. We can testify. We can help you understand what your what your rights are. And so that's FSC. FSC now, you know, we are sort of the front lines for defense. So, you know, we'll, you know we've got a lot of age verification laws going on. We are the ones that are challenging them, you know, in state after state after state, um, you know, and, and to the Supreme Court. We're the ones that that do that work. And so the industry supports us. And in turn, we support the industry. So what exactly did you start doing? So you saw Prop 60 come out and you're like, okay, I can help in some way. So what was that next step for you? So I had, you know, I actually had gone, there had been a couple of um, industry shutdowns, Mm -hmm. right, over sort of HIV scares. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm a gay man of a certain age. I'm familiar with the epidemic. I'm familiar Mm -hmm. with the virus. I know how to talk about it in a way that is not stigmatizing and, you know, also aware of the danger, mm-hmm. right? This is sort of maybe 2013, 2012. So I'd gotten involved. I'd worked for a couple of studios, um, you know, or, or sort of been assisting them in terms of like dealing with press. Uh, and then FSC sort of called and said, hey, can you help us with this? So I, you know, I started just sort of getting on calls and saying, hey, listen, if I were to do the messaging, I would do it a little bit like this and and helping be a feedback or a guideline or helping them say, you know, this is how you reach out to a journalist, Mm -hmm. right? Or this is what to expect on an interview. Or if you're uncomfortable with an interview, here's different precautions that you can take or things you can negotiate with a journalist ahead of time um, to make you feel more comfortable the same way that going on set would, you know, you would establish, here's my checklist, here's my guidelines, here's my nose. And I started doing um, consulting. I started uh, talking with 
studio heads, right? And giving them media training. I started talking with workers and give them media training. I started doing introductions to journalists or if a journalist called, they brought them through me and I would sort of break them down. Here's all the stuff that you need to know. Here's people who can talk to these different types of experiences. So it became almost like a call center, right? Where like, if something was happening in terms of media, if something was happening in terms of politics, they would call me and, and sort of figure out like, what's our strategy here? How do we deal with this? You know, answering very basic questions about, I've never talked to a journalist before, what should I expect to, you know, how do we craft this messaging in terms of, you know, uh, what headlines we're gonna get after this hearing tomorrow. What has been the biggest legal win for the Adele industry since you got involved with the FSC? I think that the biggest win and, and really was sort of Prop 60. And I think that um, you know, the FSC had had victories before. It had gone, it's gone to the Supreme Court and it's won. It had a battle over um, essentially sort of barely legal content or what we used to term barely legal mm -hmm. content, um, which, you know, was basically saying that if, if something looked like it was, they were underage, um, you know, if it was the, if it didn't matter if you're 24 in pigtails, if, if a prosecutor thought that you looked too young, you would be brought up on, you know, s sex abuse charges, essentially, sort of, you know, child pornography. Which is right? insane. It's in it's, Because that's such a, like, I mean, you let one person decide that. I mean, it's the same with obscenity, right? Like, yeah. it's just like this kind of arbitrary decision by what one person, de I mean, then that's such a slippery slope. And it allows you to harass the business, right? Yeah. So I think that anytime that you're talking about you know, abuse material or people who are underage or, or, or things like that, you know, you're dealing with, you want a clear line, right? If somebody is 18 or they're not 18, right? Yeah. They can consent or they can't consent. Once you start having, you know, conservative prosecutors say, well, I don't like the way that that person looks, you know, or, or you know, then, and there's no sort of standard, well, then they can go after anybody. It doesn't matter if, you know, there are performers who look young, but are 28, 29, 30. Um, that's not the same, you know, and, and the, pro the, the the penalties for child pornography are incredibly high, right? It's like 25 years in jail. So being per, per, per uh, image. image. Yes. And I know that because in the Tracy, Tracy Lord Lawrence scandal, parents, yes. when my parents were facing jail, that was like the one thing that my father was you know, that's why they destroyed all their content because yeah. they had like hundreds and hundreds of pictures of her and yeah. frames of a of a video and yeah. just like absolutely terrified. Yeah, this industry has always, I mean, in my experience, and I'm sure yours as well, has always been really, really locked down when it comes to age, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's no joking, there's no pushing, right? Like someone may look younger, uh, you know, have a younger look, but we make sure that they are of legal age, that they are consenting, that this is sort of how it goes. And I think that, um, so FSC had sort of, so there was a law that was passed that said, you know, if you look underage, it's the same thing as if you're actually underage. Um, nobody wanted to fight it. FSC fought it. We went to the Supreme Court. We won. It was a victory, not just for us, but also for Hollywood, because the way that the law was written, it was if you appeared to be underage or if you appeared to be having sex. So in that regard, you know, whether it's Romeo and Juliet or Euphoria or something like that, if it looks like it is a minor having sex, even if you're not seeing the explicit sex, you could be brought up on child porn charges. Yeah. And so obviously they weren't probably going to go after Hollywood. They were going to go after us. Yeah. Um, but we fight those victories. So that was probably the biggest FSC victory for us. Prop 60. Again, it was when we started out on that, it was a ballot initiative that would mandate condoms in adult films. And if you didn't, you know, if you didn't use a condom, whether you were making your own content or whether you were, you know, shooting for a studio, the enforcement was that someone who watched that video could sue you, mm -hmm. right? Yes, so someone watches your video, you've got a content on a clip site um, or a fan site, they see that you're not using a condom, they're going to sue you because it's they think that it's a bad message, right? That was sort of what it was. Um, that means that they get to drag you into court, right? That means that you get harassed and, and performers saw this immediately and said, first of all, my body, my choice, right? There's reasons when I want to use a condom. There's reasons that I don't. Um, I'm tested every two weeks. I make these decisions about myself. And two, I don't want my stalkers coming in and having an excuse to say, oh, you didn't do this. Well, I'm going to drag you into court. Yeah. Right. I mean, I've got. There's a lot of those. So many girls have like really crazy stalker fans yeah. that will use. I mean, so many girls like deal with uh, catfishing, right? And then these these fans get catfished by these fake accounts, 
happens to me too. I had some guy reach out to me the other day, said that he gave some fake Holly $7,000. And I said I was going to move him out to my farm in Texas. I was like, I don't have a farm in Texas. You know what I mean? And then he was just like, oh my God, I'm handicapped. I can't afford this. I'm like, why the fuck did you send the money then? Yeah. Like you obviously never spoke to me. Like it was just, you know? So, but anyways, I, I have a friend um, who has this, this one guy who is convinced that it's her fault that he felt for a scammer. And he's like trying to drag her into court. He's like harassing her because he sent money to a fake version of her, which is not her fault. No. It's just, and it's just crazy. And and one thing I do actually want to say about, um, the condom law, a great, um, representation of, of why it was like, not an ideal law whatsoever was actually when I was uh, hosting a show for Playboy TV called Adult Film School. And so the whole premise of that was we took real couples that had been together for a long time and they wanted to make a professional sex tape. But because of the condom law and because it was Playboy and they were like very much about, you know, playing by the rules, I had to take these couples who'd been married for 25 years, had three kids not only do I have to now put them like in front of a crew on a porn set and have sex, which is like intimidating for everyone, I have to make them wear condoms. Yeah. These like real life couples who don't wear because they're a couple. It was crazy. The fail rate was like ninety percent. Yeah, it was so bad. It when it was so bad that the second season we took it to Austin. Yeah, because of that condom law, so we took that work out of California. Because if you were not shooting in California, you didn't have to follow these regulations. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's exactly it. when you have people who come outside the industry, they have these ideas as how the industry works and and what should be done, mm-hmm. and they don't have the insight that that people who actually work on set do, and they don't want to listen to people who work on set because they think that again we're dumb, we're criminal, like we're manipulated or or whatever it is. And as a result, they draft legislation and they draft regulation that just doesn't work because it's based on fictions, right? It's based on myths. It's based on things that they've seen on an HBO show, but not based on what the reality of everyone's lives and and jobs are. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break. And then when we come back, we're going to get into today's uh, legislation and issues. So stick around. We'll be right back. Hey, listeners, are you ready to transform your sexual wellness? Meet Butter Wellness, the brand that's revolutionizing men's sexual health with a focus on education, innovation, and approachability. So let's talk about their standout product, the Perennium Massager. It's the only device designed for external stimulation of the male G-spot. So no, guys, you don't have to stick anything in there. Experience stronger, full-body orgasms that redefine pleasure. But that's not all. The perennial massager also helps combat erectile dysfunction and promotes prostate health. By increasing blood flow to the pelvic region, it aids in achieving stronger erections and strengthening pelvic floor muscles, which helps prevent ED and other prostate issues. It can also be a wonderful couple's toy. Women love it as a clitoral stimulator, making it perfect for shared pleasure. So whether you're adding spice to foreplay or it's the main event, it's versatile for everyone. You definitely should start off with their starter kit, which includes the Perennium Massager and their water-based lubricant. This pH-balanced, lightweight, hydrating lubricant is free of glycerin, glycol, and parabens, offering a natural, long-lasting glide for solo or couple sessions. Better Wellness is elevating your pleasure. And right now, Butter Wellness is offering our listeners 15% off of your entire order when you enter code HOLLY at butterwellness.com. That's Butter Wellness, B-U-T-T-E-R-W-E-L-L-N-E-S-S, and use code HOLLY to get 15% off of the Perennium Massager or the Butter Starter Kit. Butterwellness.com, code HOLLY. The link is in the episode's description. All right, guys, we are back. So... This is kind of a good segue question. What was the biggest loss for the FSC? You know, I mean, I think that like we are always working from a deficit when it comes to like when we're when we talk about Prop 60, right? It starts out, it's like 75% of people are in favor of it, 25% are, are no, yeah, of, in favor of the mandatory condoms, 25% are proposed. You know, we fight and fight and fight and fight, and we have a huge victory because 
we get 60% of the people to oppose it mm-hmm. ultimately, right? We, we, when we get together, we can do it. I think that one of the things that was sort of the most dispiriting for the industry um, and for, you know, sex workers more broadly, right? This wasn't something that FSC necessarily led on, but in, you know, 2017, 2018, um, SESTA-FOSTA, right? A pair of uh, federal pieces of federal legislation that were um, sort of meant to go after sex trafficking, right? And made a carve out, uh, you know, uh, of Section 230, which, you know, is a federal law that sort of protects platforms, and basically resulted in the deplatforming of, um, you know, sex workers who were doing full service work, who were, you know, advertising on Craigslist. They lost the ability to advertise, right? They lost the ability to vet their clients. You know, they they lost all these platforms where Backpage and and Craigslist and and Reddit all had resources for sex workers because of this law that got passed in the course of like three or four weeks. Um, all those resources went away because there was liability if you were hosting a platform that accidentally or somebody, you know, bad actor used because they were trafficking or something like that. Um, it it sort of resulted in a lot of sex work censorship. So I think that that was really a, a, a defeat, not, you know, FSC again did not lead on that, but we were involved. Uh, everybody was sort of upset by it. But I think that what came out of it was um, a tremendous amount of organization in the sex work community. And I think that the 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 silver lining is that the work that we're doing now and the power that we have now and the voice that we have now is was sort of born at that point, right? Prop 60 was important because it brought a lot of people together. Sesta Fosta really, um, the passage of that law and the 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 fallout from it really made people aware of what the stakes were. And I think that it also really alerted journalists to the issue that sex workers face, right? This this law was sort of passed, was rushed through. It had bipartisan support. I think two people voted against it uh, in the Senate, you know, very little opposition. And it had a huge devastating impact on sex workers. And I think that was one of the places where sex workers started saying like, hey, listen, um, we need to get together and we need to get organized. And I think that, you know, as always, as a community, a, a, you know, sex-based community, we take our wins when we can and we learn from our losses. But I think that that was, you know, that was sort of the, in, in some ways, the beginning of the modern sort of like sex worker activism movement. Mm-hmm. Can you be a little more specific on like how sesta fosta hurt sex workers? So basically platforms, the, one of the foundational uh, rules of the internet is that platforms are not responsible for what individuals post on them. So if I post something on Facebook that accuses you of being a criminal, right? And, and you know, I, I say some sort of libel against you. I make a claim that, you know, you stole from me or, you know, that you have this history or whatever. Um, you don't sue Facebook, you sue me, mm-hmm. right? In the same way that if somebody made a, said a quote in a newspaper, uh, made a claim against you that was untrue, you could sue um, the person who said it, but not the newspaper. And so that's one, one of the fun foundational things. If you are the same way, we don't sue AT&T. We don't sue the phone company because criminals used the phone company when they were plotting their crime. Mm-hmm. And, and so that sort of principle was transferred over to the, the, the internet, um, right? That individuals, if you're posting on a fan site, if you're posting on, you know, Reddit, if you're doing all that, Reddit is not responsible. They can good faith moderate, they can take content down, they can develop rules, but so long as they're not aware that this is untrue or that aware that this is a crime, they're not responsible for it. Everyone sort of agreed at that point, you know, that was a, a good principle. Um, but the anti-trafficking, and, and by which, I, when I say anti-trafficking, I mean the sort of the faith-based people who don't believe that sex work is work, mm-hmm. um, said, all right, that's all fine and all, but we need to do that. When it comes to sex trafficking, we need to make an exception. And so if a platform is used and someone is trafficked on that platform, right? Someone posts an ad on Craigslist and it looks fine to Craigslist and there's no evidence of, of any trafficking or that anybody's being forced. But if it turns out that that person, you know, um, was actually being trafficked or they were underage or something like that, um, even though Craigslist didn't know, even though they 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 did their vetting, um, you could sue Craigslist. And um, it really changed the sort of our relationship with the internet. And of course, what happened when that law passed was that immediately platforms got rid of anything related to sex work because they said, I don't know, you know, what if 
this resource that we have for sex workers is used by a trafficker, right? Mm -hmm. What if this person who is in a um, subreddit talking about their experience as a sex worker turns out to be trafficked, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to have liability. And, and not only can they come after our company, they can come after the people who work here, right, with criminal charges. And so what we saw in the immediate passage, I think 20 minutes after this law was signed into law, Craigslist got rid of their, um, you know, their their casual encounters where people were posting and just being like, I want to meet you, right? Mm -hmm. Even if it wasn't sex work, it was just like, oh, I saw you on the bus. I think you're really cute. Mm -hmm. Missed connections type stuff. Right. Um, well, we don't know that, that somebody in there isn't being trafficked, so we have to take that down, right? Uh, subreddits where sex workers were trading information about how to stay safe, that was taken down. Mm -hmm. So... In sort of creating this liability, it had this huge chilling effect um, on what type of conversations could happen around online around sex work. And as a result, it pushed a lot of sex workers offline. People who had been advertising online safely, had been able to vet their clients, had been able to advertise, were suddenly pushed onto the street. And um, violence went up, you know, uh, death went up, right? Because they're now pushed into more uh, dangerous situations because they can't talk to their clients beforehand, they're meeting people on the street, it becomes a lot rougher. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So before we get into the issues that we're facing today, which I know is like such a big topic and there's so much to talk about, I just want to touch on the sex trafficking yeah. issue because that's something that, you know, has come up so much. And that is something that a lot of people, when they hear about, you know, these anti-sex trafficking organizations, they think, well, of course, yeah. I want to get behind that. Like, we don't want sex trap. We don't want yeah. people forced into sex, which we also don't want. <laughs> but the problem is, is that, like you said, it's a lot of these faith-based organizations whose ultimate goal it is, is to eradicate sex work in all of its forms, whether it be in-person, full-service sex work or porn on the internet, hide behind this anti-sex trafficking agenda because that sounds like something that everybody can get behind. Yes. So can you talk a little bit more about like, how prevalent is sex trafficking, actually? You know, I actually don't know the numbers, but in, we've, we've talked about it in terms of our industry, right? There's almost none, right? Like, in terms of what we're doing is we're looking at, um, you know, model releases, right? We're working, if you're working on a fan site, a fan site is making sure that the money is going into your account, not somebody else's, right? They're making sure as best as possible that people are consenting and they're agreeing into it. There, and then there are very few cases related to trafficking related to our industry, right? You think about we're an industry that makes millions of pieces of content a a year, right? I mean, even a month, right? I was if you look say, at like a day, a day, right? Like there's <laughs> tons hour? of stuff. So it's a very, very minuscule percent. I think that what where we get with the the anti trafficking groups, and and like you said, we all agree, right? Nobody wants trafficking. You know who doesn't want trafficking? Sex workers, right? They want like they're the ones that are on the front lines, right? They're the ones that are most vulnerable to this, right? They're the ones that are going to be affected by this if they are, you know, if if we allow coercion or, or you know, force or fraud or, or or things like that. So they have a vested interest in this more than some faith-based organization. They're the ones that really should lead on this. Um, most of these organizations that call themselves anti-trafficking don't believe that any sex work um, is valid, right? They don't believe, they believe that all sex work is trafficking um, because as they say, well, there's money involved. How can you consent when there is money involved? As if the work that we do is, you know, can be non-consensual because you're getting paid, um, you know, or, or you're being coerced because you're being paid and maybe you need to make rent. But that's not the same as McDonald's where, you know, people are freely going to McDonald's to work because they don't, they love it, not because they need to pay bills, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Like when nobody looks at a McDonald's cashier and it's like, that's labor trafficking because you've got to pay rent. So <laughs> you're not consenting to be in front of this register, yeah. right? It's, it's just this different thing. And so I think that you're right, right? When you hear anti-trafficking, people think, oh, I'm a good sit too. So are we. But these people are doing it in bad faith, right? A lot of the groups that are pushing the anti-porn legislation, for instance, rebranded themselves as anti-trafficking, you know, around the time of SESTA-FOSTA because it was more palatable to, to legislators and to press than, you know, morality or anti-porn type language. Right, right, exactly. I mean, didn't morality and media rebrand themselves as, uh, oh my gosh, what National is Center on Sexual Exploitation. Yeah, and Cozy. Right? Yeah, yes. Yeah. And their website is endtrafficking.org. Yes. Right? The other thing that really kills me about the sex trafficking argument is that, you know, so often it's, you know, 
it points towards women, right? Because yeah. it's, it's it's almost always like the women are the victims. And for me, that's infuriating because I see it as this very sexist view where you automatically assume that like women have no agency over their choices and they are not sexual beings and they couldn't actually decide to take on this career because they actually enjoy sex and they see a way to monetize a thing that they love. So it's like this whole idea that like women are, should not be sexual. They are not sexual. They cannot make, you know, sound choices. It's always like, there's always a man behind that that's pushing them into it. And like, that makes me so mad. It's this old Ugh. Victorian, <laughs> it's this old Victorian idea. And yeah. I, I spend a lot of time in these fever spumps, right? Like well, one of the things that FSC gets to do, right, is that I get to go to weird conferences, right, mm -hmm. where these people are speaking. And I get to sit in on webinars and I read all of their blog posts and listen to podcasts and, and things like that. And at the, the root of it are two things. One, a woman possibly wouldn't possibly do that, mm -hmm. right? Like, because they think of themselves, right? I'm a good Christian woman. There's the only way that I would ever have oral sex on film would be if I was being forced. Like no woman wants to do that. Mm -hmm. No woman likes to do that. They're like, even if if they say they're consenting, they can't be, they must be unhappy about it because I would be unhappy. Yeah. I would feel degraded. Yeah. And so that's part of it, right? That like no one, they can't conceive that somebody might want to do this. Yeah. Um, and so in their head, they must be being forced. The other thing is this idea that by you doing it, by you creating content, by you participating in adult film, it's forcing them to do dirty sex acts, right? Their husband is going to watch this oral sex scene, and then he's going to come home and want me to do that to him. And I mean, it's a weird myth, right? But it's it's, it's that idea. Like, your activity is creating a situation for me. So even if you're consenting, even if you're doing it, well, I don't consent to that. And it's it's the most bonkers logic, like like thread of logic that I've ever heard, but I hear it over and over again. They're gonna want me to do that disgusting stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't wanna do it. And so the best thing that we can do is shut down all of that disgusting stuff. Because if my husband doesn't see that, then he'll never come home and expect me to perform oral sex on him. Right. And you know, our industry talks about consent constantly. So we're in support. If you don't want to, to perform oral sex on your husband, we don't want you to have to do it. Right. But we want to give you the language to say no, and we want to give your husband the education to understand you can't force someone to do that, or you can't pressure someone, or, you know, you know, theoretically, you could go to a sex worker, yeah. um, you know, and actually do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think also, too, I mean, not to get caught up in, in all of this, because I know, like, again, we have so much more to talk about, but the, this idea of just the basic shame around sexuality, right? And like the the fact that men who watch porn are in some way like cheating on their wives, which is like also insane to me. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, masturbation is bad and self-pleasure is bad. And it, you know, creates addiction and it corrupts, you know, the family unit and, and all of these myths that are um, really, you know, just uh, incredibly damaging for the yeah. industry. And for people, right? Like, I think that there's so much shame around sex and sexuality, um, you know, and, and our desire. And like, that's what leads to sex crimes, right? That's what yeah. leads to, you know, a lot of the stuff that's actually bad that's happening. And our industry is actually, you know, one of the, the people who are talking about these things. We're talking about consent. We're talking about different sexuality. We're talking about genders, right? We're at the forefront of this. And I think that that often makes us a lightning rod. Yeah, absolutely. I'll never forget, I had Dr. David Lay on um, way back and I asked him about like, you know, why he decided to get into, um, you know, the psychology um, with, with sex work. And he said that before he used to always believe that, you know, swingers, there was some kind of disconnect there. There was some kind of mental issue there. And then he found that when he actually would, would work with them, that they had better communication than like the traditional married couple. And he said that that really started to change the way that he thought about it. And I have found that to be true that, you know, my parents were swingers and the the communication and like the level of trust too is, is often stronger in those cases because you kind of have to have those conversations if you're having sex with other people and you have to talk about boundaries and you have to talk about, you know, your wants and desires. Whereas the traditional married couple, I think often it just comes with these assumptions that 
we're going to be together forever. We're only going to have sex with each other. We're only going to do missionary, you know, once every six months to have a child or whatever. And then there's no room to talk about what one may want to try or what one may feel like they're lacking. And then they turn to something else in shame, in secrecy, and then it comes out and then the other person's angry, but they never felt that they had the option to talk about what they wanted. And I hear this from a lot of men that I talk to, like a lot of listeners of the show or like fans who say, I want to, you know, I want to do these things. I want to do them with my wife, but I can't even talk to her about it, you know? And that's always like really sad for me to hear. Yeah, so. absolutely. Okay. So let's talk about, let's talk about what's happening today. What's going on <laughs> in the world today, Mike? <laughs> so, you know, there was, I have a theory, right? And, and, and um, I think that it, I've, I've sort of looked and I think that it bears out, but I think that, you know, we had a long sort of ascendant period as an industry, right? In the, the, the early 2000s and the 2010s where, you know, you think about things like Pornhub were talked about in, you know, on late night TV, on, on the news channel, right? Like, you know, it, the, there was a lot of discussion about sex and sexuality. It seemed for a lot of us who had been through some of these other fights as well, mm-hmm. like porn is normalized, right? Yeah. Porn is mainstream. We talk we about it all the time. <laughs> exactly. Like, you know, like hentai and da, 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 you know, like, We've been all, accepted. like, exactly. Like, it was, it was, and it was like, people would talk about their favorite stars and, and yeah. stuff like that. What I didn't quite realize was that there was a movement building of people, a backlash, right, that was building because all of these faith-based people, these people who don't like porn, and it's not just faith-based, there's also sort of an anti-porn feminist left, um, you know, were really sort of building with outrage. And I think that um, when uh, COVID happened, when when the lockdowns happened, um, you started see there was something really interesting that happened, which was health departments started saying, hey, listen, you know, don't go hook up. You know, you should masturbate. You should watch porn. You should do all of these sorts of things. And I think that it, it was the 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 straw that broke the camel's back mm. for a lot of a lot of people who were sort of otherwise anti porn. A lot of people started getting on OnlyFans. A lot of people who normally would never do porn got on OnlyFans and suddenly started making all this money. And the industry, the media was celebrating yeah. it and talking about it. And I it- can't tell you how many girls come to me now who previously, you know, were kind of against porn, like like friends of the family, like old, you know, and have kind of been like, so like, how do I start on OnlyFans? Yeah. I'm like, what? Where did that come no, from? They always want to sell feet pics. Yeah, I know. Everyone thinks they can get rich on feet pics, okay? <laughs> it's not that easy to get rich on feet pics. You got to do a little more than that. <laughs> I've been in D.C. I've been in, in Congress yeah. meeting with staffers and being like, if you have a little extra time, could you tell me how I can make money on feet pics? You know, it's it's <laughs> like there is it's it's you're it's absolutely entirely what you're saying. <gasps> oh, my God. But yeah, I mean, it's it's it. The conversation around it has really changed. I think when people see, they get this idea, it's so easy to make money in this sort of private-ish way, right? Because it's like, there's not a lot of Yeah, you're not going to be Jenna Jameson, right? Yeah, you're not going to be on Pornhub or the tube sites. Like, you can keep it all in one place. But anyways, go on. So what happens, you know, as you talk about, right, the fan sites explode. (laughs) Sorry, I'm just laughing about you going to like Congress and like some lady pulls you aside and is like, uh, how do I make money off feet pics? Literally. But also fuck porn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, but but suddenly it becomes, you know, there are, it goes from, you know, 2,000, 3,000 people working in the San Fernando Valley of LA to millions of people worldwide who are are, are making money in porn. And someone in Ohio would be like, would more likely think their daughter was going to become an alien than become a porn star, right? It was just this this thing that was like the most extreme thing that would never really happen. It wasn't something part of your life. But when you find out that like millions of college students are doing this or your the librarian is doing it or that a nurse is doing it, one, it normalizes it. And two, it becomes much closer to home. And I think that that really sparked a backlash. I think a lot of people said it's getting out of control, right? Like, I think that that, that sparked a wave of legislation and a wave of attacks. We saw it with the Trafficking Hub campaign against Pornhub happens at the same time as you've got the explosion of OnlyFans and the lockdowns and the fan sites. Because there's also 
this something that happens during this period as well. We're all locked down. And, you know, it goes from when we were talking about your a, a, an anti-porn husband or wife or whatever it is. Um, what are they doing in that locked room? You know, what? Are, what is my college student doing? They're home now and their door's closed, right? There's a lot of sort of like, oh, this could be happening. It's sort of in front of my face. And so I think that um, a lot of these movements were sort of born out of that that lockdown period of COVID, right, where the, the explosion of fan sites, where they were like, we have to do something. And so a lot of these laws start germinating at that point of a lot of these anti-porn campaigns, and we start seeing the backlash really build. Mm -hmm. So now we are seeing some age verification laws coming down the pipeline, which I think have been a surprise for a lot of people. Uh, can you explain a little more about what they are? Yeah. So one of the other foundational principles of the Internet, we have a right to access the Internet anonymously, right? That as a legal adult, I have the ability to go on a site. I don't have to ask the government's permission. So long as the content is legal, right, um, I have the ability to do that. I, I can do it. I don't have to register with anybody. I don't have to get any approval. Um, and this has been laws for decades and decades. Um, and, and what... We started to see in when the porn backlash started to build was that people were trying to figure out ways to get around the First Amendment. The First Amendment protects porn, right? Porn is, people don't believe me sometimes online, but porn is considered speech, right? That so long, the same way that music is considered speech and the same way that performance art is considered speech, even if you're not talking, even if it's just, you know, hardcore sex, it's it ha is afforded the same rights as a book or novel or political protest or all these. There's all these different things. I got involved in an argument with an anti-porn person one time and they were like, speech is words. And you're like, well, you don't, yes, it is words, but it's also all, like legally, it's all of these things. It's mm -hmm. expression. When we are, if you're making a sex tape, if you're making a, a film, right, you're doing it, you're expressing your sexuality. It comes with a political message. It comes with a personal message. It comes with a, like, you have a right to do that. And so conservatives were looking for ways to get around this First Amendment principle because we haven't had a lot of obscenity prosecutions the way that we have in the 80s for a variety of reasons. But they were looking, how can we get around it? And ultimately, I think what they settled on was a strategy that was similar to what they had done with reproductive rights, which was, we may not be able to get around this just yet, but we can make it really, really difficult and dangerous. And so what we saw was, um, a law got passed in Louisiana from a uh, faith-based legislator, right? A faith-based therapist who had been doing, I think, maybe porn addiction, maybe conversion therapy type stuff. It's hard to tell. Selling, selling uh, porn addiction, uh, like uh, anti-seminars. I see that yeah. a lot, actually. Yeah. And so he's like, I will help you be free of your porn addiction. Pay $150 for my nine-week course. Yes. I mean, and more, right? And a lot of it, when they're talking about porn addiction, what they're talking about, because people who identify as porn addicts don't watch any more porn than anybody else, mm -hmm. but they feel guiltier about it, mm -hmm. right? And they, and often, I, I was looking at a stat recently, the average person who calls themselves a porn addict watches porn 10 times a year. Really? Yes. They just are obsessed with the fact that they don't want to watch any porn. Mm -hmm. So anytime they slip up and watch porn, anytime they're like sex drive gets the best of them and they jerk off they're like ah oh, i've i've fallen i've like you mm -hmm. know so it's not about volume it's not about destroying their lives it's about this idea that i shouldn't have to watch any of it and i will also say like for people that i know who really do like it has definitely interrupted their lives and they've spent way too much time doing it i think that we can take that same and we can also point towards just like media consumption in general yeah like some people spend like way too much time on social media oh God, way me. too much time at home like on netflix and that kind of thing but it doesn't instill that same kind of shame that people feel around porn and ultimately it's like it's a impulsion kind of thing and a yeah. lot of times it's it's a way to try to maybe avoid other things that are going on in your life but it's not like for me it's not specifically like a porn problem. It's a like whatever your escape is from whatever is happening in your life. Like it happens to be like maybe that thing. Absolutely. I mean, I think that that's it, right? There is, com everyone can be compulsive. Yeah. You know, there, there are different ways. I mean, there used to be, I, I can't remember, there used to be a TV show about sort of like my strange addiction or something. Oh, like, yes. You know, people would eat chalk, people would rocks. like rocks. Exactly. Yes. Like you can be compulsive about anything. Yes. And, I, and you know, media can be an escape, right? I can, 
I was just like, I was talking to somebody online. And I was like, people want to talk about porn addiction. I was like, nobody ever talks about like Jane Austen novels. Like you start reading. I'm like, oh my God, I'm so into this book. I can't stop reading it, right? <laughs> I don't, I'm, I'm not getting my work done. I'm not, you know, like there's ways in which you can avoid the stuff that you're doing, right? TikTok, right? Yeah. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're addicted in the sense of like, this is has an addictive feature to it, right? It's just, you're escaping, right? You're, right. you're doing it. So yeah. I'd like to see these TikTok like um, addiction courses come yeah. up for like $150. Take my nine week course and I will get you unaddicted to TikTok. We should also ban TikTok because it is destroying lives. That might actually be true. <laughs> that part might actually be true. Well, addiction, porn addiction also is often about like, I watch gay porn and I don't want to watch gay porn. Yeah. The, talking about it in terms of an addiction, blaming the the content is a way of externalizing, right? It's not me that I'm gay. It's that I've been lured by this addictive I'm also video. like, I'm also not gay and I'm also not a man, but gay porn's like kind of hot. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it is. Sometimes it's, yeah. it's a, it's. I'll agree. Like, sometimes we go that, I go that way. Yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah. you know, I like men. I like dicks. Yeah. Like yeah. Why two would you men not? and two yeah. dicks. Yeah. Oh, it's right. perfect. Yeah. And it's like perverse, you know, yeah. like, like, right. like, and they're like, everyone like dirty. Sweaty, yeah, yeah, and like, yeah. yeah. Rawr, and there's a lot of grunting. I never want to hear the girl. I'm like, yeah. oh my God, shut up. <laughs> I always want to hear the guy and the guy's always quiet and straight porn, but in gay porn. Mm -mm. Yeah. Anyways, go on. Let's not talk <laughs> so about anyway, me. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we're in the middle of this backlash, right, mm -hmm. against porn, against sex work. Um, obviously, there is a conservative backlash more generally, and there's a lot of concern about what women should be and how they should react and should they be subservient to men, right? This is it's part of this larger cultural project where people are really trying to rein in women's sexuality, women's independence, women's reproductive rights. So I think that it's important to sort of look at it in, in that context. But mm -hmm. one of the ways that they start doing that is to say, okay, well, we're going to make it as dangerous as possible, right? We're going to make it as difficult as possible. And so they pass this law in Louisiana in 2022, it goes into effect in 2023, that says in order to um, access adult content online on an adult site, you have to verify your identity. When they make that pitch, they it sounds reasonable, right? When we flash our ID, when we buy a Playboy at the gas station, we should, you know, or, or liquor at a liquor store, we should do the same thing online. There's there's no difference. And the problem is that there's a huge difference. Um, you know, when when you flash your ID at a gas station, um, nobody keeps a record of it, right? Nobody, it, it, it's seamless, it's quick, it, it's free, right? There's no there's no sort of friction that comes. When you're doing it online, it turns out that most people are really fearful about uploading their ID for good reason, right? One, identity theft, right? You don't want that that information. You don't want your ID. You don't want your face scan to, to show up for anything, right? It's, it's, it's difficult. Um, two, it is um, really complicated. So, you know, if, if you've sold content on a fan site, you know what the verification process yeah. is like. Yeah. I got to scan my face. I got to hold two IDs up to my face to like prove it's me. I got to show them the front, the back, like everything. Social security. I mean, as an adult uh, creator, you have to give all of your information. And I actually remember when the 2257 law came into place many, many, many years ago. And, and my dad was kind of like pulling his hair about it because now producers had to keep all of these highly sensitive information on performers, their social security yep. number, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, just file it away in a, a filing cabinet somewhere or it's in a manila folder in a laptop bag and then it disappears. Then it, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, like it's, it's highly sensitive information. Highly sensitive information that like any idiot can can take. And now like who knows where the fuck it goes? Yes, yeah, exactly. Like that's incredibly insecure. And that's the price. I mean, what yeah. what the industry has, you know, conceded is that that's the price of doing business, yeah. right? That like if I'm going to sell and I'm going to do this, I'm going to verify, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it, it may be a pain in the neck, but I'm making money. So there's an incentive for me to do it. Right. For a consumer, there's no incentive, right? They're like, well, I don't want to undergo all of these risks just to access a site that I should be able to access, right? That I have a First Amendment right to be able to access. Um, and so what they do is they don't do it by and large. So what we saw was, so this age verification goes into effect in Louisiana. Um, 
Pornhub attempts to comply, right? They say, okay, we're going to see what this is like. We're going to do it as an experiment. Immediately, their traffic drops 80% because people won't won't do it, right? People are like, I'm not giving up my ID to, to access porn. It's complicated. It takes a long time. There are tons of sites that are not verifying because they're located outside the US. I'm just, or I'm going to go to Reddit or I'm going to go to Twitter where there's tons of content and they're not affected by this law because of the way that it's drafted. Um, you know, I'm going to go somewhere else. And I think that um, what we've seen in state after state as this law has gone into effect are two things. One, I think the 80% number from uh, Pornhub in Louisiana was very optimistic. Um, I mean, I thought it was sort of best case scenario. Louisiana already had a digital ID. They already had some of the processes in place. Most states don't. Um, in most places where this has gone into effect, what we see is adult sites seeing their traffic drop 97% immediately, right? They, they try to do it, end up maybe they have 3% of the traffic they did the week, you know, you know, after they institute age verification. So it has this huge chilling effect where it, it dissuades consumers from going to these sites. Um, the second thing we see is that the legislators who have passed these laws say, great, we're glad. We don't think anybody should be going to these sites. And so, you know, like I said, as they did with reproductive rights, they made it more dangerous. They made a lot of liability. They passed all these laws, right, in terms of abortion, that if you helped somebody, you know, if you were an Uber driver and drove them to a clinic, you could be sued. If you were, if you didn't have a hospital access and you were a clinic, you couldn't operate. You know, you had to have a waiting period. All of these things that we saw over the past 10 or 20 years that institute to make it more and more difficult to actually get an abortion they started doing with porn. They saw that as a playbook. And so, yes, age verification for consumers is a big part of it. We see a lot of legislators just really cheering, like when when a platform says, I'm, you know, I'm not going to operate in this state anymore, because the other thing is it's very expensive. So say you're Pornhub, you have a million visitors that come to your site, you know, from a given state, um, that's going to cost you $150,000 per month. Mm. to verify all of those people. Right, because it's it, the burden falls on you. The burden falls on you. Right. And so it, it's basically meant, I think, to kill businesses. I think that it's meant to push the industry underground. What it has done and what we sort of see is that, you know, the people who benefit from this law are pirate sites, right? Sites that are already operating outside the law. Sites that you can hit the back button on Google. You go to Pornhub. Pornhub doesn't operate anywhere. You go back and you find another site that does. It's located in Russia or the Netherlands or India. There's no contact information for how you're going to find it. They're hosting leaked videos. They're hosting stolen videos. You know, sometimes they're hosting revenge porn and, and, and CSAM, right? Child pornography. Um, that's where you're going. So these sites, as we sort of look at the numbers, these sites have been exploding in states that have passed age verification laws. So what you see is an, in, an industry where, you know, they're trying to make it more and more difficult to operate a legal business. Um, and they're trying to uh, make it harder and harder for consumers to actually access this. Now, if you were going to a website that had a, a paywall, so you couldn't access any porn until you you paid, um, are you you still have to provide your ID as well as your credit card? Because the idea, I guess, ultimately is that because you can't get a credit card before you're 18, right? In most states, you can't. Um, that won't be acceptable in terms of age verification. So we've talked about that, mm -hmm. you know, um, in terms of you could. What if we did a credit card or something like that? Because most people with credit cards don't. The legislators said, well, no, but what if a kid uses their parent's credit card? Or what if, um, you know, you get a you know, you can have a signer on your card, right? I, if I mm -hmm. had a kid, I could theoretically, I think at like 16 or something, maybe I can get a debit card for them or something like that. So there are ways where it's not perfect, but but one of the things that, but so in most cases, no, even if you've got a paywall, even if everything before the paywall is safe for work, you know, as soon as there's an age verification law, you also have to take their ID or under have them undergo a background check, check their credit bureau. There's all these different very invasive ways that the legislators have laid out that you have to do it. The easy ways they don't want you to do. Right, right. Do you think that there ever could be a world in which there is like an online, a, a secure online ID that's almost like kind of universal that people will use and like they verify their age once and then like their identity is 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 safe in some third party place that is trusted and then that like would identity token way. would be the way that they could access things or not do you see that in the future i mean i think that anytime that you're doing verification it's going to 
over the the internet right, to a third party. Right. It's leaving your phone. It's leaving you know where you are. Um, it becomes dangerous because it can be intercepted. Right. Any database that that exists can be hacked. Right. Like we've been told this, and this happens in these laws. They say, oh, well, people can't keep that information. We know that that's just magical thinking, right? That's not the way that the internet works. I think that the closest that we get to that is something that is um, based on your phone, right? So when I open my phone, I have to scan my face, mm -hmm. right? Apple knows who I am, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Apple has, a, as does Google. I will tell you, Google probably has a pretty good profile on what my age is, right. you know, like at least within 90%, right? They know I'm not under 18. Mm -hmm. um, these companies already have that information. You know, if you have an iPhone, I think that that's the sort of, you know, the closest way that you sort of get to it without exposing that information unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there have been other talks about, you know, could we use tokens? Well, tokens can also be sold. And like, you know, none of these solutions are, are perfect. I think the best way really is going to be at the device level. And I think that more and more people are coming to this realization that if you want to stop kids from accessing, you know, Pornhub, the best way is to do it with the phone because the phone can block you from accessing Pornhub, right? You try to go to it. If you're trying to, you know, the problem, like I said, with, with these laws that are based on a specific site having to verify your identity mm -hmm. is that there are always going to be hundreds of thousands of other sites that don't, yeah. right? There's always going to be people that are outside the reach of the state of Louisiana, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and, and so if you want to do it, there are effective ways, there are effective filters, there are ways that, that that are going to be more effective. If someone's dedicated really is going to want to find adult content, there's always going to be a way for them to do it. What you want to do is to to get it so that the large majority of people aren't able, the large majority of minors are not able to access it easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, got it. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the current political climate. As yep. I mentioned earlier, as of the date of this recording, uh, Biden has dropped out. Kamala Harris is more than likely going to be the Democratic nominee. Um, you know, Trump is obviously the nominee for the Republican Party. And there's been a lot of talk about Project 2025. And in there is a plan to eradicate porn. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so the the Republican Party platform has had anti-porn provisions for quite some time, or, or, or sort of like, I shouldn't say the platform, but the party itself has harbored these ideas that we should be going after adult businesses in the same way that they were able to go after adult businesses in the 80s under Reagan, right? They want, they don't believe that that we have First Amendment rights, right? If you're a creator, you don't have a right to do it. You can, it can be, your job can be made illegal. Um, and so we've seen that sort of, that general idea and the general idea that people shouldn't have access to porn bubbling up in, in different ways. So in 2016, uh, Trump signed a pledge from a group called Enough is Enough. It's a sort of anti-porn group that said, you know, if elected president, I will go after, you know, adult businesses more aggressively. You've had these age verification laws, you've had these laws, porn is a public health crisis that have been passed in various states. So it's it's sort of been in the ether. I think that Project 2025, uh, which came out last year, in, in around this time last summer, is a plan for a um, the first 180 days, I think, of a, a, a second Trump administration. So it was put together by the Heritage Project. It was co-signed by, I want to say, 50 plus uh, conservative groups. And it addresses lots of different issues, right? It addresses immigration, it addresses taxes, and it's sort of, here's what we're going to do, right? When we're back in power, this is what we're going to do. Heritage Foundation is very close with the Trump administration. They've sort of bragged that they're sort of like the staffing agency um, and have been in the past, you know, in, in the first administration. So this is very closely tied to them. On page, I think it's five of Project 2025, it says, you know, it, uh, pornography is not some sort of Gordian knot of the First Amendment that we can't get around. Um, it's evil. It's criminal. Um, it's addictive. We can do all of these things to do it. And, 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 and by pornography, it's important to realize what they're talking about is a whole host of things that they don't like, right? So that's reproductive rights. That's LGBTQ content, right? That's that's literature that deals with race. Like, they've, like and, and I'm not saying this. I mean, they say that specifically in Project 25. They say, pornography as manifested in, you know, transgender ideology. So they're already sort of are naming that, like, we see all this trans stuff, it's pornography, right? When people mm -hmm. are talking about their trans identity, that's pornography. Um, they're also saying, 
pornography causes trans identity and and causes all these things. So they've, they're sort of mm -hmm. mixing all of these things together. Right. But they're saying, hey, listen, people who distribute pornography, people who create and distribute pornography will be arrested. Pornography will be banned. Cable companies and websites that host pornography, right? Internet companies that host pornographies will be shuttered. And people who distribute pornography will be forced to register as sex offenders. So they have this, it's a very bold call that we're going to take back this country and we are going to eliminate um, not only what we think of as, you know, fan sites and, and tube sites and stuff like that and what we think of as, as pornography, but also books and literature on LGBTQ content, right? Across the country, what we've seen in libraries is that, um, you know, uh, graphic novels and novels and Toni Morrison are being pulled from libraries because parents are saying that's pornography. Mm -hmm. We need to pull that out. Kids shouldn't have access to it. In Idaho, there's a library law that's quite similar to our age verification laws for websites that says if a kid accesses uh, pornography in your library, um, you can be sued, right? The librarian could be sued. And so what they've had to do, similar to what we talked about with, with Sesta Fosta, is they've just either pulled out any book that could potentially have even the word sex in it, or they've banned kids from accessing the library. So now in Idaho, in, in a lot of libraries, you can't go in, you can't go in with a kid. A kid cannot access the library, the public library. Like a Not bar. A, like, yes, like a bar. <laughs> so it, this, is, this is sort of the world. And I think that for a lot of the conservatives in particular, they're like, yeah, that's great. We actually don't want them. We think there's lots of bad ideas there and we would like it to be difficult. So that's sort of where we are. We're in a really hostile moment. Um, we have been for the past four or five years. I think that a lot of the, the, the arguments, you know, keeping kids from accessing porn, we can all agree on, um, but the methods that they're doing it are being done in bad faith, right? They're doing sort of save the children, and in order to save the still children, we have to end an open internet. We have to end anonymity on the internet. We have to, um, you know, deny access to libraries. We have to deny access to ideas because kids could possibly access this. And we, as, you know, faith-based conservatives don't want that. Mm -hmm. um, question from me and many other uh, women out there. What about feet pics? Does that fall under? Yeah, I mean, like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know Can we still do feet pics, Republican Party? You know, because I, I hear you make a lot of money with those. <laughs> But so seriously, though, so, OK, so this Project 2025 has kind of just exploded in the narrative, like within, I feel like, the last couple months. Yeah. Um, and recently Trump came out and, you know, tried to distance himself from it and says, I don't know what this Project 2025 is. You know, it's extreme. I'm not extreme. What do you think about that? Well, when he is, I mean, so it, I, I was watching an interview this morning. And he was like, Project 2025, there's some good ideas and there's some bad ideas, um, but I don't even know what it is, right? Like, so like, you're like, okay, first of all, you do know what it is. These are people who are very close to you. These are people who are part of your administration, right? This is your running mate, you know, has called for banning pornography, right? Um, he thinks that it should be banned entirely. And also it's been in the news for the past three months. You haven't looked at it. Like you don't have any idea what it, what is in it, but you think some ideas are good and some ideas are bad, but you also don't know anything about it. Um, so I think that it's a little bit disingenuous. Now, another interesting uh, development has been, of course, Kamala Harris. She was behind Sesta Fosta. Mm -hmm. And so she was in a lot of, you know, sex workers, bad books. How do you feel about her being the Democratic nominee now? You know, I mean, I have watched, you know, when Kamala was sort of, uh, you know, the presumptive nominee as of, you know, I think five days ago or mm -hmm. six days ago. Um, I was really interested to see how sex workers would um, approach it, right? Mm -hmm. And I saw two things happen. One is, you know, there are people who just say, I hate her, right? I Sesta Fosta destroyed my livelihood. Um, I have a real, like, I'm, I'm not going to support her. And that's absolutely reasonable, right? Like, I think that, you know, you, you think about it, um, any issue that's important to you, like you have the right to say, I'm not going to support it. Um, I've seen a lot of sex workers also say, you know what? Our choice is not Kamala Harris or somebody else. It's Kamala Harris or Trump. Mm -hmm. And Trump has said, I'm going to ban porn and I am going to make people register as sex offenders. And I'm going to, you know, there's all of this, this, uh, this, this broader stuff that 
you know, you're not choosing between, you know, I, I think there have been a lot of people that I've been surprised who have said, the, who I thought might have been, I'm not voting for Kamala, say, you know what, I'm being pragmatic. Like, she's not perfect on this. Um, I, you know, she supports theoretically the Nordic model, which is sort of this faith, you know, it, it's a, a another sort of like, it goes under the guise of decriminalization, but it's also terrible. It's um, the idea where you prosecute the people who hire the escorts yes. as opposed to the escorts, Yes, right? which means that like, if you're prosecuting the people who hire escorts, well, those people are going to be even less likely than to give their information to a, you know, an escort, right? right. To be, to so be verified so verified that they can, right? So it makes yeah. the work safer or, or less safe. And it right. also means that and often that like the person who's renting an apartment for you can be prosecuted, you know, or the person who is your bodyguard who's driving you to a, a uh, you know, event can be prosecuted. So I think there's a lot of, um, you know, sex workers hate that as well. And so I think that, but I think that again, people look at this and are, are often saying like, you know what, we have two choices. Um, and while I don't like this one, this other one is worse. Yeah. What can performers do to help support the industry's cause? I mean, I think that the biggest thing, I, I talk to performers all the time. I talk to studio heads. I right, we, the, the biggest issue is that people don't uh, feel confident speaking out, right? For the reasons that we talked about earlier, but particularly because they don't always know the issues, right? Um, they don't know how to respond with all of these things. So I think that the best thing that you can do is to really spend a little time and sort of get educated. There are a lot of resources out there. There are a lot of articles that have come out. The BBC had a really terrific one yesterday on age verification and what it would mean. Because it's being adopted in Europe as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, they're trying it in different ways and, 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 and are coming across a lot of problems with it, but this is something that that's happening. And I think that... Um, Understanding that this is part of your business, and as a business owner, you under have to understand the business landscape. Um, you know, Free Speech Coalition is a resource, right? In in terms of helping people, we're we're doing a webinar next week uh, where we're going to break down Project Twenty Twenty Five, the age verification laws, you know, our court challenges, and and all the rest of it to help people understand and feel more confident. But we're also putting together resources so that people understand the issues in a more digestible fashion, so that they feel like, hey. I get called on this. I'm at a bar and someone says, I like age verification. I understand how to respond to them because the untapped power of this industry is just the audience that comes with it, right? Mm -hmm. Like there are millions of adult creators, right? And those millions of adult creators have billions of fans. And I'm not saying that you need to make the choice to become political on your, your feed about absolutely everything. Um, but I think that one of the, the powers that I saw with Prop 60, that I saw with uh, Sesta Fosta that I've seen in other battles is that when you come out and you're able to speak from your lived experience, this is how it's going to affect me. People really respond. It's really, really powerful. Whether you're saying, you know, this is the reason I choose not to use a condom. You know, I might use one in my private life, but I don't use one on set for this reason. Or when you say, hey, listen, right, this uh, financial discrimination is is destroying my business. It's 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 making it really difficult for me to do it. Or when you say, when we were talking about your um, the 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 stalkers or the the, the frauds, right? Censorship on social media platforms, my inability to become verified means that scammers can become verified and steal from my fans. When you talk about those issues from your perspective, it's really, really meaningful and it really, really changes minds. And it's really hard for people to argue again. So I want people to understand that like, they really do have the power you're really fucking smart, right? In, in terms of like, you know what happens to your what what happens to your business and your career and your body much more than anybody else. Like, we can walk you through the age verification. I'm happy to get on the phone. I'm happy to like, you know, I I tweet about it all the time, but I also get on the phone constantly with people. Be like, here's how you answer those questions, or here's what the issue is, or here's where we are with the court case, um, so people can feel more confident. But like. We have so much untapped power. Mm -hmm. And I really want people to get involved and understand that even if you're not commenting on the political race, or even if you're not commenting on, you know, Trump versus Harris, you can talk about age verification. You can talk about this means because it's meaningful to your fans as well, right? 97% of your fans don't want to go through this process. Mm -hmm. So it's a prime example of something that people are pretty much universal on saying, like, yeah. Um, I'm open to understanding why this is bad law and what can I do to 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 change it. Now, um, what can the fans do to help? The fans can also get educated, right? Mm -hmm. Like understand that I I talked to somebody yesterday, a fan, 
online and he said, well, I don't understand what the big deal is. Like you just click, I'm over 18 and that's verification. And you're like, well, that's not what they're talking about. I was like, that's, that's, that's not, you know, the, the, the pop-up that says click the green button um, is not age verification under these laws. You have to scan your face and you have to upload your ID. Um, and he said, well, that's crazy. I'm not doing that. You know, so I think that like being able to talk with, with fans, understand what the issues are, understand how this is going to affect you, understand what it's like. You know, I mean, you can go on Reddit, you can like spend a little bit of time and by a little bit of time, I mean like 15 minutes, right? Read an article or two, understand what the risks are. Um, and it's, it's really sort of like, oh, I understand what you're talking about now. Invest because this is, this is meaningful to you, right? If your name gets leaked because you went on boundgangbangs.com, right? What's that going to mean for your job? Right. What's that going to mean for your social standing in your family? Right. If it, like you were talking about all the people who write to you who are like, I can't discuss this with my wife. What's going to happen when your browser history gets leaked? Mm -hmm. Right. This is an issue that affects you. It's up to you to learn about it. You don't necessarily need to be public about it. We want to respect your privacy. But, you know, use your vote, use your voice to oppose things that are, you know, bad for you. Yeah. Well, Mike, thank you so much for coming on. Um, can you tell everybody where they can find the Free Speech Coalition and how they can donate? Because these things cost money, people. <laughs> All this work has money. Yes. So freespeechcoalition.com is sort of the home base. Um, we're also available on, it's on Twitter. It's at FSC Army. Um, my Twitter is at Mike Stabile, M-I-K-E-S-T-A-B-I-L-E. Um, I talk about these issues ad nauseum, um, just sort of repeating myself every day. Um, and I also share a lot of articles, right, in terms of what is happening. You can subscribe to Free Speech Coalition. It has a newsletter that, that sort of updates people on, on what's happening in terms of the um, the news and also sort of you know, the, the court cases and things like that. There are other lots of creators who are talking about this as well. There are lots of people who are knowledgeable. So when you see somebody talking about it, Pay attention, right? And and follow them and, and sort of dive a little bit deeper because it is really interesting. You know, I was on a call the other day with a bunch of uh, civil rights organizations um, from the left and the right and some legal counsel and things like that. And, you know, they talk about these and this isn't, you know, porn is the canary in the coal mine of free speech. You know, what happens in these cases doesn't just affect us. It's going to affect the entire internet. They go after us first because we are the leading edge, right? We're the 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 the, the organization and the, the industry with the least defenses. And they know that if they can create an opening the way that they did with Sesta Fosta, um, you know, in regards to porn, then the whole internet is basically you know, theirs, right? And so understand that this is not a niche issue. This is an issue that affects you. This is an issue that affects like the future of, frankly, our democracy. Mm -hmm. It's almost kind of like a leak in the dam, right? Yeah. Cr crack gets bigger and bigger. And it's a Trojan horse. The whole dam explodes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're going to do a special bonus Q&A because a bunch of my Patreon members sent in some more specific questions for Mike. So um, if you're a member of my Patreon, you can go check that out. Otherwise, thank you guys so much for watching. Um, you can find me on Instagram and Twitter or X at Holly Randall. Of course, if you want to support my Patreon and listen to the Q&A we're about to do, patreon.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered, hollylinks.com for links to all of my socials. And please just uh, educate yourself. Make sure you go to freespeechcoalition.com. They are an incredibly important organization for industry and we owe a lot to them. And uh, just thank you so much, Mike, for coming on. Thank you guys so much for listening and I'll see you next week. <laughs>